Hey Swifties, welcome to a brand new episode of Swifty School, where together we walk down Ilya Street covering the latest news and Easter eggs from our fearless leader, Taylor Swift. I'm your host, Reagan Bailey, and it is enchanting to have you here. Now that we're out of the woods, let's get into today's episode. It's another great day to be alive at the same time as Taylor Swift. Hello, everybody. Now, before we get into today's episode, just a little reminder that while I wish, hope, and pray that I could one day be associated with Taylor Swift or Taylor Nation, I am not in this episode and podcast is merely an expression of my thoughts and opinions. Now, 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 I feel like as we inch closer and closer to the highly anticipated release or maybe not highly anticipated. I'm curious to know your thoughts. Are you nervous? Are you excited? How are you feeling? As we inch closer, I'm curious to know where are you guys at? Like, I feel like for me personally, Taylor the past year has become so gargantuous in terms of like the spotlight that I keep forgetting that we're about to have this like intimate thing of new music and as intimate as like new music that the whole world can access could be. But I feel like I saw a video last night and it kind of gave me a good perspective of just like a couple years ago, we didn't have Vigilante, Midnight Rain, Maroon, You're On Your Own Kid. And so much good has come from all of that. Like think of the friendship bracelets and trading, obviously the Eras Tour, but I wouldn't say that like necessarily came from the Midnight's album. But so much good in my life, hopefully your life, all of our lives have come from the release of that last album that I don't know if I've like done the mental gymnastics that is necessary to prepare myself for what will be the tortured poets department in literally like a week it's so exciting i think what i'm looking forward to most is i love that feeling when you go to target wherever you're going to go buy your cd or take pictures or whatever it might be of like everybody else being like that cumulative excitement I, i i think there's a word for that i can't put my finger on it but just like everybody feeling something good for once I think this is like a big, bad, scary world and you could cut it a bunch of different ways. But at the end of the day, we're all just these cute little humans. Like I think we were reminded of that. If you saw the solar eclipse recently, I just, it warmed my heart to see so many people just being cute and being humans and going outside and like literally staring at the sun. It must be exhausting, always rooting for the anti-hero. I think it was really cute. It was really cute to see everybody just come together and do something fun. And I think that's what I will walk away from the Eras Tour and all of Taylor's new albums throughout the rest of my life loving most is just that feeling of everybody being happy about the same thing that really has no downsides to it. Like what what could possibly be bad coming from music that everybody loves and enjoys and can talk about. Nothing. Like literally nothing. I will be honest. I feel like I've been in a little bit of a lull in terms of what to actually talk about. Like I can only conspirize so so much and so far with this new album, right? So I'm excited that she gave us these playlists, the Stages of Grief playlists. Now, full transparency, I am not an Apple podcast girly. I am very much a Spotify girl through and through. I am proud to say I converted Matt to Spotify not too long ago because I feel like Apple podcast or Apple music, I should say, I'm sorry. Apple music to me is like living in the stone ages. I don't know how to navigate it. If you are an Apple music person, which I know most of you guys who listen to the podcast listen to it on Spotify. So I think the majority of you guys are Spotify, but maybe I'm wrong as to where you listen to your music versus podcast. Apple music to me, I don't understand how to navigate it. It feels like something my mom would like versus like Spotify is very like modern. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'm going on a tangent with that. But Anywho, I am not an Apple's music girl, so I had to listen to these like bootleg versions of the little voice audio clips because I didn't feel like downloading and dealing with the whole Apple music thing. But I have them all here in front of me. I've listened to them. I've dissected them. And I want to get into my thoughts surrounding the stage of grief. Now, just a little recap of everything that we have going on before the release and after and upcoming with the release. I talked about this a little bit on my Instagram stories earlier this week, but lots to talk about. Lots going on. I think I'm curious to see, and I've speculated about this quite a bit, will she be at Coachella? My thoughts with Coachella. I feel like people, this was a mixed bag in terms of people's thoughts in terms of the PR. I want to specifically say the PR and not the marketing behind the album. They have marketed the heck out of this album. They've posted on Instagram a million and one times, I know there's billboards going up around places, but to me, like, that's kind of an easy, like, everybody, obviously, you're going to post on Instagram about the album. What I'm talking about when I say there's, like, a lack of PR surrounding the album is, like, interviews, going on the late night shows, you know, just doing things that are a bit more 
expo- like exploratory, like explaining the album a little bit more, giving us context into where she was at. I do have a sneaking suspicion that we will get a magazine, a lengthy magazine interview, similar to her Time Person of the Year interview that we got from her. I did see, have you guys seen it on Amazon? Maybe I'll have it linked for you down in the comments or in the description of this podcast. But on Amazon, if you go to, I believe it's Rolling Stone, their official like Amazon storefront, they have a pre-order for a Taylor Swift cover magazine coming out. And they said it's coming out on April 12th. So I guess that'll be what, this Friday? If you're listening to this the day it comes out, I'm curious to see if that's actually true. I think it would be really bizarre if it wasn't because it's like available on Amazon Prime and for pre-order and it's on the actual like real Rolling Stones storefront. So I think that within the next week, we'll see a huge ramp up whether she attends Coachella or not. And I'm not saying Coachella is her making a PR move. I think it would be positive PR just to get her name back in the rotation like I've been speculating for a while. But I think something more intentional like a magazine interview might be exactly what we need to like pull us through these last few days before the album comes out. Now, these playlists, I think they were really fun. I think it's fun. It gave us a lot more to decipher and that's what I want to spend today doing with you. So as a little recap, the stages of quote unquote five stages of grief that we are referencing for the sake of Taylor Swift is number one, denial, going into anger, anger from bargaining, bargaining to depression and depression to acceptance. Now, I'm not a therapist. I don't know much about these stages of grief, and I'm very blessed to not have had, you know, too many traumatic experiences in my life that I feel like I can resonate super heavily with these five stages. But I think we can, no matter if you're six years old or 60 listening to this, I think we've all dealt with this on some sort of scale, whether it's on the scale of like love and heartbreak, like Taylor is most likely referencing. Well, she's most definitely referencing love and heartbreak, let's be real. <laughs> I think you could um, say this definitely could apply to friendships as well. You know, when you're in denial of the friendship going downhill, you get mad at each other or you get mad at yourself for letting it get to that place. You try to reconcile. It doesn't work. Then you're sad and depressed and then you accept it and move on with your life. I think we could apply that to a lot. I think you could apply it to not getting into the dream college that you applied for or whatever it might be. So if you necessarily don't resonate with like the love message. Perhaps you can kind of think through it that way today as we talk through these five playlists that Taylor created. My question for you, and I want you guys to answer this in the poll if you're listening on Spotify down below. I want to know your thoughts. Do you think, be for real with me, do you think that she added or created these five stages of grief before or after seeing fan theories? I have always wondered, I've long time speculated that Taylor, as we know, she has a complete master plan. She plans this stuff out ages in advance. She's got, you know, spreadsheets on spreadsheets. But I think that with the power of social media these days, she definitely does lean into a lot of fan theories that pop up and kind of plays along with it. So my gut feeling with this one is that she did kind of play along with this stages of grief situation. But unless maybe I'm totally wrong, Taylor did have this planned all along. I I don't know. I'm curious to know what you guys think. My thought is she leaned into it. But without further ado, let's chat about arguably the most depressing part of grief, which is denial. I think, like I said, we could relate on any sort of level. I've definitely been in, you know, a decent amount of relationships. None of them as long as my relationship with Matt, which has been a very long time with moments here and there of not being together. But I think denial when it comes to love is tricky because especially if you're a people pleaser, especially if you're someone who hates the defeat Like for me personally, I hate letting people down. So I feel like when something love related or friendship related doesn't necessarily work out how I hoped, I beat myself up over it. And so I think the denial stage is arguably the most depressing because depression, the stage of depression for me, I feel like I associate that with kind of like self wallowing and self pity. Whereas denial is like, you're really fighting that sort of like angel and devil on your shoulders and your heart and your head which to me is even more evil and hard to deal with than the rest of it. Because most often than not, when you're in denial or the stage of denial, you haven't shared with people where you're at. Like I feel like denial, you're still – all these thoughts and feelings are still living in your head. And for me, that could be the biggest ghost of them all. So the message from Taylor reads, this is a list of songs about getting so caught up in the idea of something that you have a hard time seeing the red flags, possibly resulting in moments of denial and maybe a bit of delusion or what I like to call delulu. Now, what I find most fascinating about these playlists that she curated is the more recent songs that she put on them. So for example, on this playlist for Denial, we have Lavender Haze and Snow on the Beach. 
I wanted to call these two out because I think Lavender Hayes, I referenced back an old video of her talking about how Lavender Hayes is a term from the 1950s. And it's a term where you're kind of in this like rose colored glasses, feeling the love, so lost in the moment. And when I reference back the lyrics of Lavender Hayes, I feel like what she's saying is she kind of recognizes she's in this like love cloud, this cloud of emotion and feeling, but she wants to stay in it. She's not ready to leave. And she's in that state of delusion. She could feel the judgment like starting to creep up on her, but she's she's not fully at that next step. She's in that weird in-between, which I think is interesting. I think I've never thought of that song that way. I, I don't know if I ever thought that song was as deep as I now think it is. But now that I know she considers it more of a denial situation, I think it's interesting. The second song I wanted to call out on the denial playlist is Snow on the Beach. I want to read to you the lyrics that I wrote down because I think these were the most poignant. It says, One night a few moons ago, I saw flecks of what could have been lights. I want to stop there. I saw flecks of what could have been lights. So for me, I'm like, she was thinking back on her memories and she saw glimpses of what could have been. She saw like hope, basically. That's what I'm getting from Snow on the Beach. She goes on to say, Life is emotionally abusive. Time can't stop me quite like you did. My flight was awful. Thanks for asking. I'm unglued. Thanks to you. Oof. I think I have not really let those lyrics set in. And perhaps I've been underrating this song for quite a while. I feel like she really lays out <laughs> literally denial in those lyrics where she talks about she's mourning what could have been. Life sucks and it beats you up emotionally. And she's realizing that she's completely unraveled and she's not in a good place. And she's looking at her partner saying like, yeah, this is where I'm at. Thanks for asking me. Like, I'm good. I'll take care of myself. And that's really depressing. The other three songs that I'll call out before we move on to anger is Cruel Summer, Lover, and Bejeweled. These are interesting. And I think these playlists really tell a story in my opinion. So like when I think of Cruel Summer, I love you ain't that the worst thing you've ever heard. It's almost like when you're screaming, crying, mad, angry at someone Or even if you're saying it to a family or a friend or maybe you're a child of divorce, like, what is it going to take for you to accept my love? And I think that's a really depressing part of heartbreak is when you realize you are putting in more than the other person or you are loving them at 100% and they're loving you at 60 or 50 or 40, whatever it might be. I saw this video before we go into anger that was really depressing. It said, like, I'm so glad I haven't gotten married yet because I feel bad for everybody who used lover as one of their wedding songs or their first dance song. And I'm like, oof, yikes. And I saw an interesting take that basically said, like, can I go where you go? Can we always be this close? Is kind of that moment when you're in denial about knowing your relationship is shipwrecked and it's it's sinking. But you are like, I saw this girl who's saying basically she associates like this stage of denial where like You're posting romantic photos together on Instagram with like three paragraph long captions. You are romanticizing like the little things you're trying. Maybe you're being more intimate than usual. And I think Lover, now that we know is a denial song, kind of skews in that direction. Now, switching gears to anger. I think these are pretty obvious, so I don't need to harp on these too much. But we've got songs like Vigilante, High Infidelity, What If Could Have Should Have, Is It Over Now? Like, come on, it's literally screaming angry. Like, Dear John, Better the Revenge, You're Not Sorry. I think these are obvious choices. Now, when thinking about, and I'll read you, let me read you her message first. She said, these songs all have one thing in common. I wrote them while feeling anger. Over the years, I've learned that anger can manifest itself in a lot of different ways, but the healthiest way it can manifest itself is when I can write a song about it. Now, looking at Vigilante, you did some bad things, but I'm the worst of them. I'm dressing for revenge. Those are the lyrics I wanted to call out because for me, knowing that she's associating vigilante with anger, the first word that comes to mind is cheating. You did some bad things, but I'm the worst of them. It's almost like when you catch someone in the act of doing something and they're guilty, whether it's cheating or not, lying, whatever it might be, and then they somehow make you the bad guy. Like you are the one who messed up somehow. You said it wrong or you should have asked differently. You should have been more sensitive. That's what I kind of think of, whether it's cheating or not, kind of pointing fingers and gaslighting a little bit. And then with high infidelity, you know, April 29th, do you really want to know where I was April 29th? I'm hoping we can get some sort of clarity on like where she was at, like not physically, but like mentally what was happening around that time of April 29th. Is she referencing the end of her relationship as she knew it? Or was she referencing cheating? Like, he was doing something and she was calling him out. And then he was like, well, where were you? Where were you April 29th? You know, that's what I 
I'm thinking of when I think of those lyrics now. But the one that really is the dagger to the heart and really associates for me anger and a little bit of denial and depression probably cumulatively describes all of these feelings is in High Infidelity, she says, the slowest way is never loving them enough. Let me backtrack on that. She says, you know, there's many different ways that you can kill the one you love. The slowest way is never loving them enough. And that's exactly what I was saying about feeling upset and in denial and angry that you are fully in, fully subscribed to your relationship, 100% giving it your all, and they just can't. And that sucks. Now, the next one that she talks about is bargaining. And this one for me is the hardest for me to relate to just because I'm not quite sure if she's referencing bargaining in terms of like when you are trying to get someone to work through things with you and you're like, hey, if I do this, will you do that? Or will you meet me halfway? Or if it's like bargaining with yourself, like, oh, maybe if I am going to be with this person forever, I just have to accept that they suck (laughs) or like that they lie or they do this. Message from Taylor reads, this playlist takes you through songs I've written when I was in the bargaining stage, times when you're trying to make deals with yourself or someone you care about. Okay, so basically what I said. You're trying to make things better. You're oftentimes feeling really desperate because oftentimes you have a gut intuition that tells us things that are not going the way, that things are not going the way you hope, which makes us desperate, which makes us bargain more. So I think it's a little bit of both things I said. It's bargaining in the like literal sense of bargaining with your partner and then bargaining with yourself and like trying to ration things. Now, I feel like this made me reframe how I think about the Great War. I never really... I guess one of my fatal flaws when listening to music is I get so lost in like the lyrics and performative aspect of songs and like feeling the vibes that I don't know if I necessarily digest the lyrics a lot. So this I liked this episode because I really read a lot deeper into I guess now that I had an emotion to associate with some songs and where she was at it, it helped me frame my mind when reading lyrics back. So the most important one for me on this playlist was The Great War. And I want to know what you guys think. What do you think The Great War was? Because for me, I just feel like scandal. Scandal and cheating is all I can keep going back to when I reread these lyrics. So I read it kind of like poetry. My knuckles were bruised like violets. Sucker punching walls cursed you as I sleep talked. She's clearly ticked off. Spineless in my (laughs) tomb. Spineless in my tomb of silence. So she's, she's put her tail between her legs. She's not speaking. She's not saying anything tore your banners down, took the battle underground. So she's keeping this under wraps. Maybe it was ego swinging. Maybe it was her. That is the most dang biggest piece of evidence that I've seen referencing her as in someone else. But I digress. Flashes of the battle come back to me in a blur. So like this moment, she keeps recounting it. All that bloodshed, crimson clover, Sweet dream was over. So the end of her relationship as she knew it. My hand was the one that you reached for. So now he's like reaching to her for comfort, which if it is a cheating scandal, someone usually comes crawling back to their original love with regret and trying to make you, you know, forgive them. All throughout the Great War, always remember, tears on the letter. I vowed not to cry anymore. If we survived the Great War, whatever the heck the Great War is, if they survived it, You drew up some good faith treaties. I drew the curtains closed. Drank my poison all alone. So I kind of go back and forth. Either this is telling me that she accepted whatever happened, whatever went wrong in their relationship, whatever he did, whatever went astray. She accepted it and decided if I'm going to close the curtain on this, if I'm not going to tell anybody, if I'm going to accept this and continue loving this person, that's on me and I'm going to drink my poison alone and I'm going to have to deal with it. Or it's telling me She realized she had to close the chapter and it was over. It was officially done and the the Great War had ended. So uh, I don't know. It's like making me so depressed, honestly, thinking about this, which is a great segue going into the Old Habits Die Screaming playlist where Taylor says, we're going to be exploring the feelings of depression that often lace their way through my songs. In times like these, which by the way, that's so depressing, (laughs) so sad that she feels depression often. In times like these, I'll write a song because I feel hopeless or lonely, and writing a song feels like the only way to process that intensity of an emotion. And while these things are really, really hard to go through, I often feel like when I'm either listening to songs or writing songs that deal with the intensity of loss and hopefulness, usually that's in the phrase where I'm getting past, getting close to that feeling passing. Oof. 
I feel like I can't get past the fact that she feels this deep sadness all the time or has felt it so often, I should say. She doesn't feel it all the time. I shouldn't twist her words. But lonely and hopeless are not two words that I would ever associate with someone like Taylor. And I think it's a really human thing of her to do to put her heart on her sleeve in this way. And it just goes back to why so many of us are so in love with her. And I think we can't fathom how someone could have the world at their fingertips, all the money in the world, all the fame, all the fortune, all the success, you know, all their dreams coming true. And then they could still be longing for something in life. And I feel this on a very, 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 very macro scale to Taylor. But I feel this because for me, I feel like a lot of my life is on display for people. If you are new to the podcast, I am an influencer, if you you want to call it that, influencer. And I post my life online and I share basically whatever I talk about all aspects of my life. Really nothing is off limits. But what I find is a lot of the times I'm like under a microscope, right? Like people are waiting for me to mess up or people are waiting to make a negative comment. On this other side, I do have a million people who are waiting to constantly cheer me on and be happy for me. But of course, the bad always outweighs the good. A perfect example is earlier this week, I posted an outfit that I'm really excited to wear to Coachella and people hated it. Like people hated this outfit. I was deleting comments left and right just for my own mental health because I didn't want it to compile in the comments. I always feel like the second negativity starts, it like opens the door for other people to feel mean. But relating that to Taylor, I can only imagine it's difficult for me to conceptualize her feeling that way. And I would love, you know, how whatever level of comfort she feels sharing more about all of that. I would love to see, I don't know. I mean, her her even just saying this, this little blurb helps so many people. And I feel like she could continue helping so many people by just sharing little moments of this part of her life with everybody. Some of the songs on this playlist, Bigger Than the Whole Sky, Dear Reader, Maroon, You're Losing Me, My Tears Are Crochet. I mean, I would say these are pretty fair (laughs) to put on the depression playlist. I think the one that I, I mean, all too well isn't obvious, but for me, Right Where You Left Me, I love that song. You guys know I love that song. Help, I'm still at the restaurant. That sucks. It's like that feeling of like sitting in the corner I haunt, cross-legged in the dim light, they say what a sad, sad time. Like sitting there in the corner of a restaurant, I'm assuming like I'm envisioning a million waiters walking by, people laughing, people cheersing, and you're just sitting there fighting this battle in your head and nobody even knows it, which is terrible. Now, the last playlist is I Can Do It With a Broken Heart, which she associates with acceptance. And she says, we finally find acceptance and can start moving forward from loss or heartbreak. These songs represent making room for more good in your life making that choice because a lot of the time when we lose things, we gain things too. I wrote down a couple notes for the songs on here. The first one is You're On Your Own Kid. And to me, You're On Your Own Kid is kind of looking back on the memories you have of your life and realizing that pivotal point where you're ready to go back to loving yourself. You're ready to hit the gym. You're ready to create a routine. You're ready to focus on you. And that's what I kind of think of with this song. I thought it was interesting with Midnight Rain where she says, he wanted a bride and all the love we unravel and the life I gave away. By saying gave away, like past tense, that to me signals acceptance because she is realizing it's not a life that she is considering anymore. She has gave it away. She is done. She realized he wanted a bride. She wanted fame. And that was it. And the chapter's closed. August, I'm like, The first two words that come to mind is with acceptance is it slipped away. Like it slipped away. It's very much reminds me of that saying of like the one who got away. Invisible string. All along there was that invisible string that tied you to me. Like realizing that you could have had this beautiful moment or experience with someone, but it's no longer there and that's okay. And you might still have that invisible string forever. But long story short, it was a bad time. (laughs) Anywho, those are my thoughts on the playlist. Curious to know where you guys are at with all of those. And I want to switch gears and shift into Swifty submissions. Now, you're welcome to send in Swifty submissions anytime to the podcast. You can find the link in the description. You can find it in my bio over on Swifty School Podcast over on Instagram. You can find it on my website at ringmillie.com slash Swifty School Podcast. All of those places, you can find it and submit anything. You could submit memes. You could submit videos that you have saw and you want me to watch. Thoughts, questions, topics, suggestions, whatever it might be. So we're starting out with Amy today. Hi, Amy. Amy, great call out. She says, Taylor's surprise song, Piano Changed. In some pictures, the flowers are all pastel and clearly painted, while others, they look three-dimensional and like fake flowers. Why have I never noticed this? Why have I never noticed this? She's provided two photos, which I'm going to try to throw up on my website for you guys to be able to reference when the episode comes out. But I have never picked up on this. 
My immediate thought and the most obvious answer would be rain damage. I do think the piano got significantly damaged. And we know that because it was like doing weird things on the tour. Or she has two pianos, like one's a backup. Not totally sure, but I never noticed that. And I would love to know the date. If anybody knows this, definitely send in a message. The date in which the piano changed. That would probably be significant. And I would be curious to know because then we could align it with either the rain shows or just like an important date that we need to pay attention to. And this one came from Bridget. Bridget said Scott Swift said TTPD was his favorite era yet, and Florida is a song he can't wait for us to hear. As a Florida girl myself, growing up there, I definitely am excited for Florida. I'm very excited for Florida twofold because I think that that is the moment. Tell me if I'm making this up. I think that's where she was in Florida doing the Tampa shows when the announcement dropped of their, their breakup, I believe. I think. I'm not mistaken. But the fact that Scott Swift said it was his favorite era. Now, I may be reading into this, but that's what we do over here. Perhaps it was because I feel like, you know, mom and dad always know best. And maybe they felt like Joe was not her person and was not the best fit for her. And so maybe he likes this era because it is finally her moving away from it. Or maybe he just likes the songs. I don't know. But I I feel like if they are these like really gut-wrenching heartbreak songs, it would be like kind of funny to me that it's like her dad's favorite era. Like I feel like it would probably be hard to listen to if you know your child was like suffering. But I don't know. I'm curious. I'm very, 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 very curious. As always, I'm so grateful for you guys. And with all of the Swiftivities that are coming up, a little reminder, I will be joining SoCal Swifties if you are in the Los Angeles San Diego, Southern California region, please join us on 420. We are going to be doing a live Taylor talk. I believe there's going to be like a costume contest, friendship bracelet making. It's a really fun meetup. I'm so excited. I'm hosting my Taylor talk and we'll be doing, think of like a live version of the podcast sort of, but like a little bit more interactive and Q&A style on 419 on Friday night at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern time. I will be hosting my clown call over on Patreon. Well, it's on Google Meet, but we It's for all my Patreon members. You can join my Patreon. I have three different tiers, sophomores, juniors, or seniors for Swifty School. Get it? (laughs) And it's $2, $5, or $10 a month, and it helps support me, the podcast, the time that I put in to create all the free content for Taylor stuff, and of course, all the different perks and things that come along with it. So you can check that out at patreon.com slash Swifty School. And I think that's all I have for you. I can't believe it. I cannot believe it. We have one more episode until the release of... TS11, and I can't wait to be on this wild ride with you. Thanks for joining. My name is Reagan, and I'll see you guys on the next one. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. I know all too well how busy life can be, and I am so grateful that you chose to stay, stay, stay. Now, just know this is me trying, and I would greatly appreciate it if you took a minute to leave a review or maybe share this episode with a fellow Swifty. Make sure you join my broadcast channel on Instagram for more Swiftivities. And long story short, this love is real, and I'm beyond grateful for your support. See you next time.